Um, we're going to begin together. As I said before, um, the ordering of the books of the Bible in the Hebrew ordering um, has Ruth not counted among the historical books, although it is historical and all the events are true, but it has it counted among the wisdom books. Um, we have in order the wisdom books, uh, not the wisdom, the writings, which are wisdom books. Um, first of all, we have the book of Psalms. Then we have Proverbs. And then interestingly enough, the next um, book in the order is the Song of Solomon. And then after that, we have Job. And then finally, the book of Ruth. Okay, this is not the um, Christian ordering, but the Jewish ordering. It doesn't matter the order, either way they're all inspired. But one of the, interest, the, one of the things, like we said last week, is um, the book of Proverbs, it ends with Proverbs chapter 31, which talks about this woman of excellent character. And she's described with all of these concrete actions because she's actually the embodiment, she's the summation of everything that the Proverbs teaches, the way that she acts. And it asks a question, an excellent woman, who can, what, who can find, right? Searching for these things. Then, of course, we get to the book of Song of Sol Solomon, the Song of Songs. And in that book, what is Solomon doing? He is looking for a woman, right? Searching. But we don't really get into her character. Instead, we get into this romance novel of um, so many exciting things happening. They're so much in love with each other. But the question is, an excellent woman who can find. Then we get to the book of Job. And yes, there's a clear woman in Job, Job's wife. But then the question is, does she cause Job more heartache or excellent feelings? But then finally, we have our answer in the book of Ruth. And Ruth is a very interesting character because she shows us what, we can, um, what women can be like in order to be like this Proverbs 31 woman, an excellent woman. Now, in Hebrew, the word for woman is the same word for wife, okay? Um, it's the same in Greek. It's just one word for woman or wife and same for man or husband. And so oftentimes, Proverbs 31 is also translated as an excellent wife who can find. And so keeping that in mind, we can also think that this is not, these characteristics and qualities of wisdom is not simply only for the woman here, right? Why? Because there are men here and they can also be excellent. We also know this. The Bible says that as a church, we are the what of Christ? The bride of Christ. And if God asks the men to find an excellent wife, what do you think he asks his own son to do? To also find an excellent wife, right? So us as the bride of Christ, men and women together, we can confidently say, God is our husband. Can we say that? One, two, three. God is our husband, okay? And so because of that, we can also look at this. Is my sound okay? Should I stay in one? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, we can look at this and say, um, is the... Um, are we, as a body, striving to live like this as well? Okay. So let's go to Proverbs 31. Um, keep your Bibles turned to Ruth. We're going to read Proverbs 31 together. Okay. Um, let's try to read at the same pace too. Okay. Kayla, can you prevent it from going to the next slide until we're ready? Okay. And then when we're done with one slide, just go to the next slide already. Okay. You guys ready to read together? Okay. One, two, three. An excellent woman who can find. For her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good and her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to distaff and her hands to grasp the spindle. 
She extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing and she smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her. They say, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Ruth, chapter 1. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. Does anyone remember what Elimelech means? God is king. Good job. By the way, it's ironic that the homeland that they left was the city of Bethlehem. And what does Bethlehem mean? House of bread. So there was no bread in those days in the house of bread. And the name of his wife was Naomi. What does that name mean again? Happy. And the name of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. This bitterness and sickness. Ephrathites of the Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives, and the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth, and they lived there for about ten years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died, and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the land of Moab, and she heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And thus may the Lord do to me, and even worse, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Now the vow that um, Ruth makes to Naomi is very interesting, right? She says right here, may the Lord do to me and worse if anything but death separates you and me. Oftentimes, people don't make this type of a series of a vow, okay? 
Usually the only vow that people make that is this serious is what type of vow? A, a marriage vow, right? Um, Till death do us part. Although even some people are removing that from their vows today, which I think is wrong. Um, but it's, it's interesting, it says, may death be the only thing that separates us. Now, I'm not saying that these are marriage vows, by no means. In fact, there are some very foolish and wicked and confused and upside down biblical scholars, well, they call themselves scholars, but they're actually fools, who claim that maybe that there was a lesbian relationship, okay? Um, but this is false. This is false by all means. But rather, we see here that there is a love for a daughter to a mother-in-law that is very close and very binding. But the interesting thing here is that, for the most part, Naomi, as a mother-in-law, she actually wasn't thinking primarily of um, when she was the mother-in-law of Ruth, before they decided to go back to Judah. She had made her own mistakes, okay? She, she had not, together with Elimelech, led their family in the proper way. Now think of this, okay? We already talked about how last week the Lord very much wanted his people to stay within the boundaries of Israel because he had a very specific plan for them. But let me ask you, when they did this, when they left, even though they left, do you think they still worshipped the Lord while they were living in Moab? Of course. To what extent, right? Now, the, the Lord clearly, Naomi, um, what do you call it? Clearly Ruth and Orpah knew that they worshipped different gods, right? Ruth and um, Orpah knew that Yahweh, the Lord, was the God of Elimelech, Naomi, Malon, and Kilion. So they knew that they had different gods. So there was at least the appearance of this thing. But one interesting thing is, this was a case of some unequally yoked marriages, right? And for the most part, it seems that in the course of these unequally yoked marriages, the women, both Ruth and Orpah, were free to continue worshiping their gods as well, right? There wasn't a case of conversion during these marriages. How do we know? Because it says right here, verse 15, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her gods and her people. Return after your sister-in-law. And there's no condemnation here about or Orpah, okay? Ru um, Naomi is not upset at Orpah. Why? Because Naomi accepts and she understands the foolish missteps that they made while living in Moab. She understands that um, Elimelech, goddess king, did not um, influence those that his, her sons married to start worshiping the one true God, it seems like they weren't actually setting up shop to provide generations of worship to the Lord in Moab. Rather, they were simply there because all they wanted to do was survive. Okay? And then, um, so she knows that even if there was an appearance of worshiping Yahweh in their house, there wasn't a change in heart. Okay? But here is something interesting. Ruth, however, somehow, her love for that family was able to nurture and grow and develop to the point that she says, well, you know what? I do want to worship their God, right? In her vow, she says, your God will be my God and your people will be my people. She's making a very serious vow. Now, we can glean some wisdom. As I said last week, what we're going to be doing through the book of Ruth is gleaning, um, meaning picking what we can from the wisdom bits here and see what we can see. One wise thing that is very important for all of us, because at this point, when they're returning to Judah, this is a point of Naomi and her family turning away from foolishness and turning back to wisdom. Okay, So we can look at the trajectory of their life now as turning towards wisdom. What are the steps that we see in the fruit of them turning towards wisdom? One of the things is that Naomi does not so easily accept Ruth's vow. Okay? She actually gives Ruth a way out. 
Notice it says right here in verse 18, it says, When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. That means there are some unwritten back and forth that was going in between her. Naomi wanted to make sure, hey, Ruth, if you're going to do this, you have to be really sure, okay? Because you have to understand that um, I know you might not have seen this while we were living in Moab, but the worship of Yahweh is actually quite different. <laughs> it's actually like really different from the worship in, of, of, of Moabite gods. You have to understand that when we move back home, um, you actually can't take your idols with you, okay? When we move back home, there is a whole lot of rules that we're going to have to start following, okay? Um, we're going to have to leave the bacon fryer at home, uh, um, here in Moab. We can't, we can't do all these things. She, there's this sense that they went back and forth, and, and Ruth was really like, no, actually, I, I really do want to commit to this. I'm serious. I'm deciding to follow. Now, it's interesting that there's just this, like, all of a sudden conversion, because sometimes when we think of um, someone turning to the faith, because I believe that Ruth's faith here is genuine, and she's, something happened, the Holy Spirit moving inside of her, and so we, we think, like, oh, man, there has to be all of this, um, like, I don't know, like this theological and philosophical discussion going on, but Ruth was serious about her vow. You know that when we decide to follow the Lord, it's not just a mental ascent, right? Um, sometimes when I pop in in Sunday school, I, I heard Tito Val talking about that a lot, about really taking our faith in the Lord. That's why we, they, you guys go through all of these things. But there's like something happens more than mental ascent. It's an actual vow that you're taking to direct your life towards God. And the proof of your faith in Jesus is going to be in you actually carrying out that vow and carrying out the works that he wants us to do. And it's the same with those who are claiming to be new believers or those who make promises to us as well, okay? First of all, the Bible says this about new believers. What should we not let happen? We don't just let a neophyte be in leadership, right? Why? Because we want to see the proof of their commitment and their vow. But let's not just talk about in terms of faith, but let's talk about also the people that we surround ourselves with, okay? Not everyone who makes a vow to you will carry out that vow, okay? Not everyone who makes that vow to you will carry out that vow. Not everyone who tells you, I will be your best friend. How many of the kids here, they use that term still? Best friend. I think when I was younger, I had someone that I called my best friend, but then they left the church, I think. And after that, I didn't really call anyone uh, best friend. I have many friends, but, but not really any um, um, best, best friends. Do, 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 kids, do, do kids still use that term, BFF? No, some, some, maybe no? You use that term? <laughs> oh, some of, your, some of your friends will use that term, right? Or um, even when you go into business, right? Do your due diligence, okay? Don't have hidden clauses in these vows, okay? Don't trick someone into becoming a believer and don't tell them and, 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 and avoid telling them that they have to give up their sin and give up their old ways. And then when they finally convert, then you surprise them. You're like, oh, actually, you have to stop doing that. Surprise, I tricked you. Have you guys ever heard of um, that one guy who um, did plastic surgery? He is a white man. And he did plastic surgery. He's a, he's a gay white man. And he um, did plastic surgery to make himself look Asian. You've heard of that, right? Yeah, yeah, you've seen, you see, and he's, he's blonde hair. And I think at first he wanted to look like a, yeah, a Korean. He wanted to look like Korean. And so he actually, he's from what? Oh, I thought you said UP. I was like, what? <laughs> from the UK, yeah. And he, and actually he was also in the process of, um, transitioning as well. Yeah, he says in his heart is Korean. And, and then he was, he's also, he says he's gay. 
he was even planning on transitioning to. Did you, did you know that he, according to him, he got born again? He, yeah, you, you can look it up. He's like, he, he, he stopped dressing up in a feminine way, although he can't change what the plastic surgery did to his face. I don't know if he intends on changing that back, but he stopped dressing up in a, in a feminine way. He started dressing up like a man, trying to get rid of his gay affectuation so much that his hands stopped going like this. And the, but he's, he, it, it's, it's like, this is an example. Now, of course, this is new believer, but as, as, as believers, we, so we watch out for this because we don't look at any celebrity and say, oh, let's enthrone them right away because they're a, they say the name Jesus. But still, it's like, oh, wow, this person is actually making an effort to, to count the, the, the cost, trying to reverse some of these things. And Ruth is serious about these things. Okay, Ruth is serious about these things. Here's the thing. You will not find many people in your life who will keep the promises that they make. You will not find many people in their, your life who will be loyal to you in the same way that they promise to be. There's not going to be many people in, their, in your life who will keep their vows as fervently as they pretend that they will. But when you find someone who is loyal, when you find someone who is trustworthy, keep in mind, though, the Bible says, do not put your trust in, in man. In fact, don't even put your trust in yourself. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will keep your path straight. But there is wisdom in knowing that when you find a loyal friend, the Bible even says this, that when you find a good friend, that's, you know, people who have many, many friends, not all of them are their friends, okay? But when you find someone who is actually willing to work with you and have life with you, that's someone that is worth keeping. Someone that is, wow, look at that. And Ruth happens to be this. And now her and Naomi have to take on this journey of, okay, Ruth, you are now in the process of becoming an Israelite woman. No longer Moabite. Let's see if you can stand the test. Let's see if you can also, together with Naomi, start living in a way not of foolishness, but in a way of wisdom. One of the first key things that there is a change in Ruth's heart, and there is something special happening here, is that she is putting Naomi before herself, okay? She is putting Naomi before herself. It is wise, it is wise to think of others before you think of yourself, okay? It is wise. Now, of course, we know the whole old plain thing, like put on the mask on your own face before you put the mask on someone else's face. We understand that, right? We understand that we need to survive and things like that. But it is wise for you to live like other people are worth taking care of. It is wise to love. After all, God is the wisest of all of us. And did he not send his son to die on the cross and sacrifice for us? Now, when Naomi comes home to Bethlehem, she understands that she's not in the place of pride anymore. Whereas before she owned property, things like that, now she is, she's in no place to be bragging. So they went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women were saying, is this Naomi? And she said to them, don't call me Naomi, for I am Mara. Mara means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very Mara, very bitterly with me. And I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has witnessed against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. Now we might look at this and say, oh, she's not hopeful anymore. Look how, look how bad she is. But one thing about Naomi is, as she's turning to wisdom, she is being realistic. Okay? There is something wise about being realistic, not in the sense that you have no hope. Because Naomi does have hope. She, she may seem bitter right now, but she's, she's actually, by actually moving to Israel, she is taking a step to better her life. 
But rather this, guys, do not have any pretense in your life. The Bible warns all sorts about people who are putting on pretense. Now when we come into the house of the Lord, we come in joyful and with thanksgiving and things like that. But if you're not rich, don't pretend to be rich, right? Naomi, she is not pretending that she has everything together. If you, like, she, she's, she's, she's not pretending like she doesn't have a lot of work to do. Um, the Bible has a word for people who are always pretending, hypocrites, right? People who are living under a mask. Now, Naomi, right away it says she had a kinsman of her husband, a man of um, great wealth of the family of Elimelech whose name was Boaz. Okay, I, wa I want you guys to imagine the ages of these people, okay? The three main characters is going to be Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. Ruth will be the youngest of all of these, okay? Ruth is younger than all of them. Why? Because it's clear that she's young. She is still of childbearing age. Um, I, I can't imagine that she's older than 20 years old or something like that, at least in, in my concept of it, because she's, she's still doing a lot of physical labor. She's still able to have children. She's a young woman. Naomi is older than Ruth, okay? She's older than Ruth. She is, um, she, she, she's had a life. She's had two sons who died already. So maybe she's in her, her 50s or something like that. Um, she... This should be the time when she's just passing on wisdom to her children, but she has no children because of all the terrible mistakes that they made. And then also, she, um, th we also have Boaz. Boaz is probably the eldest out of the three of them. Okay, um, Boaz is not close in age to Ruth. We don't think of it in that way. And you'll see why later on, um, Boaz actually is shocked when, him, when, when Ruth proposes to him, and he says, oh wow, you are wise because you didn't choose a young man to marry. She's not choosing someone who is the same age as her. Okay, just keep in mind those things. And they all have different positions in society. Boaz is a man, so he has his property and he can inherit it, he can pass it on. Um, Naomi in, in society, she has property that she could potentially access, but since she has no husband and no sons, she can't really avail herself of that wealth that is technically hers, but she can't really, so she has to live in somewhat poverty. And Ruth is even the furthest outsider because she doesn't even technically have any Israelite blood, okay? She's a Moabite. And Moabites were one of the people that the Bible explicitly um, tells the Israelites, like, stay away from these people. If there's some evil people, it's the Moabites, okay? Now, um, but Ruth is turning away from the sin of her and her husband. Um, and so is, um, so Naomi is, and so is Ruth. By the way, the thing about selflessness, one, another thing to think about is one of the best ways to counteract sin and repent from your sin is to turning to selflessness, okay? Because sin is one of the most selfish things that you can engage in, all right? When we sin, you really aren't thinking of others for the most part, right? Um, sin is very selfish. Satan is the most selfish person there is. There is no selflessness in him. He is never thinking of others. So one of the key attributes of someone who has turned away from sin is someone who is thinking of others, just like Ruth is thinking of Naomi. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, please let me go into the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I may find favor. Okay? So, one of the first things that Ruth does is start working hard. Okay? Everyone say, work hard. Okay? One of the wisest things that you can do in your life, whether you are young or whether you are old, is to work hard. Um, the tradition there is that um, this is actually their form of, of welfare back then. Okay? Ruth 
did not try to see, maybe I can be a weaver. Or maybe I can be a healer. Maybe I can do this. Maybe I can train and go, um, become an uh, artisan or something like that. She saw where she is and she says, you know what, I'm going to stoop low to do whatever I need to do to survive. Okay? Ruth, just like us, should not ever see any form of job as something that is beneath us. Okay? So the, the way it was is that if, your fee, if you didn't have a field, if you were poor, if you were in a lot of debt, if there was famine in your area, if something happened, the Bible makes allotment in that those who were prospering, they were commanded that as their harvesters are harvesting from the field, right? You know this, those of you who have gardens, sometimes some of your produce does what? It falls on the ground. Okay, falls on the ground. One time, um, we have a uh, ceiling plant in, at home, and one time, my dad asked me to pick all the peppers, and I picked them all, and then I had them in, like, uh, a cup. You know those just styrofoam cups, so there's no weight to it. And then, like, the moment I finished, I put it down, and then it all fell on the ground, okay? And then the wind blew it all over the place. I picked it up, though. There was no one coming to glean it. Okay? <laughs> but the, they, they would pick it. The Bible says that if your produce falls on the ground, um, to these people who own these fields, don't, don't pick it up. Okay? Just get the ones that you can pick up. Get them and gather them. And that way, if there are poor people in the town, then they can come to your property and they can go ahead and glean. Okay? They can work. And when you pick, like, the grain, don't get all the bits of grain. Leave some on the plant so that the poor people, they can work. Why? Because God, interestingly enough, in the welfare system that God created in Israel, he doesn't want it to be that those who are in need um, just get things automatically, and for free. which is really interesting, right? Because we say... That God is what type of God? Starts with a G. Generous. Generous. Another G word? Giving. Giving. And gracious. Right? Gracious. And when we think of the word gracious, we think of another word. Starts with an F. Ends with a re. Free. Right? We think, oh, if he's gracious, then he's just going to everything for free, free, free. Right? I'm sure this, some people, if they... If, if they're given the opportunity to get something, but they have to work for it, but not paying any money, they might be a little bitter towards the person who is providing to them. But God is not like that. God is not saying, God did not tell the rich people, pick up those plants that fell and hand deliver them to the houses of the poor people. He didn't say that. He didn't say, take them and um, put them on a cart and have the cart go around the city and drop it off at the place or bring it into a storehouse and let the people um, come and just take it. Now, there was a poor tithe. There was a, a storehouse of, of, of money that people could get for it that was welfare. But as far as food, as far as for what people need to survive every day, the primary way for the poor to get food in the, way, in the system that God designed it was supposed to be that the poor would actually then go out and one of the ways they would work is to pick the food, okay? And this way, they don't even have to worry about job application or a master accepting them. Why? Because they themselves are the, are the ones who are picking, right? They're the ones. It's up to them to get up from mourning, to get up from crying about the bad harvest or the loss of a job or an apprenticeship and go and start gathering food, okay? And it says here, and she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. So she wasn't trying to take advantage of Boaz, but it just so happened that the field that she came to belonged to Boaz where her fortune would be found, okay? Now think about this, how we can apply it in our own lives, okay? 
right? We don't try as believers to say, the Lord prospers me and I'm so prosperous even though I don't make so much money and even though I need to feed my kids and provide for them, I'm going to live my life as if I'm so prosperous and spend my money so freely, okay? We don't try to fool ourselves and delude ourselves like that, okay? We don't just spend like we have an unlimited amount of money. Um, now, we don't live in a poverty mindset and sit in and just like grieve about the things that we can't have. We don't, we don't live in that poverty mindset. And we do know that we're rich because if your father is rich, then you are rich. And who is your father? God. God is your father. But let's look at some of these practical things here. First of all, if you need a job, what is one solution you can do? Get a job, right? If you need a job, get a job. There is no shame in work, okay? There's no shame in work. And I'll say this, there's no shame in work for parents. There's also no shame in work even for students, okay? I've seen some students get through difficult, difficult courses, um, but they didn't have scholarship. Some of them were immigrants, right? So they couldn't get access to FAFSA. Some of them, all sorts of different things. And some of them, they didn't want, the, the, their parents aren't able to um, pay for these things and things like that. So they worked through school. And keep in mind, some of these people that I know work through school, they worked through school still did excellent, got like a 3.9 GPA, and were faithful in their church as well, okay? Why? Because when you are in survival mode, you decrease the things that you don't need to survive, okay? So guess what they did not do? They did not go to parties. They did not eat out every single day. They made sure they cooked for themselves. They saved up. I had one friend who... So she couldn't, she wasn't eligible for FAFSA. She was an immigrant. Um, she was, she, she, she was a full-time student and she had to take a lot of um, odd jobs and things like that. And it seems like she was in an endless cycle of, of need and I felt bad. But then one thing that was difficult was that every single day, um, and, and she's an immigrant, so parents aren't sending money. Parents are from a poor country. But every single day, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, she, she paid her tuition, but she was also eating at Panera every single day. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I don't think of Panera as a um, budget foods. Yeah, it's expensive. I don't think of it as a, as a cheap place. When I was in college, there was this one time, this deal at Panera, that if you signed up, you could get a free bagel every time you go there for the whole month of April. And the reason why they put that promotion was so that hopefully because they're giving free bagels, you'll be incentivized to also buy something else as well. I gotta be honest, I took advantage of that and I did not buy a single thing. I got those free bagels every single day, okay? I was like, I'm not gonna be fooled by, I'm not gonna spend money um, to, but I, I've known people who, Every single day they eat out when they can't afford it. They're not, you know, she wasn't on scholarship like I was. I was able to get a huge scholarship and things like that. And I, I was like, why is this person spending like that and, and doing that, okay? The other thing is that some people also, when they're in need, they also want the appearance, okay? Everyone say appearance. The Bible says this. The Bible says that God does not see the way that man sees, okay? What does man look at? The outward appearance. And what does God look at? The heart. God looks at the heart, okay? God looks at the heart. This is one of the things that I had to learn um, growing up, especially as the Lord has um, prospered um, me and my family a lot more. I look back, though, 
at the things my parents did when I was younger, and I feel, I, 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 do, I do repent and I regret the way that I reacted to a lot of those things. For example, one of the things that would, ha would happen is that for the most part, all the clothes that we got as we were kids were what? From the hand-me-downs, but also from, from thrift stores, right? As a kid, we didn't understand why any time we wanted a toy, my parents didn't take us to Toys R Us right away. Instead, we would get like those, you know those $2 or 99 cent bags from the thrift store that contain just like a bunch of wild toys that you don't even know what they are? And I remember as a kid, we would, um, we would complain to my mom to the point that sometimes I look back at the words, now this is before James and Joel were born, the words that like, me and DJ and Kuya would say, but if I really remember, it was mostly me and DJ. The words that we were saying, you know, sometimes I'm like, wow, we were like almost like bullying our mom, right? By, by saying, we, you know, because I don't know, um, but back then we would get like, they would, right? Do they still do that in thrift stores where when you check out, if you get a lot of clothes, they put it in a black garbage bag? They, they used to do the, the big garbage bag. And we used to complain. We used to be like, oh, it's, it smells bad. It, um, what do you call it? You know, we're around all of these, these, these scary looking people, right? Because it's all the Arabs and Indians who are running the place. And we would, it would be so biased. And we're like, we don't want to do this. The aisles aren't clean. Um, you know, and we would, I remember one of the things also was during Harvest Festival. Um, no, it wasn't even harvest. We had a, uh, no, we had, no, this was back in Central. Does anyone remember back in Central when we had the, the presentation about creation, right? And then someone played Adam and, and Eve, and then all the kids were there. And I remember I was like excited. I was like, oh, we're going to get a costume. And of course, as a kid, where do you want to go to get costumes? You want to go to Party City? You want to go to the Halloween store that was on Milwaukee? You want to go all these places? But my mom brought us um, to uh, Salvation Army, and they had costumes there. And I remember I cried and I cried because the costume that she found that fit me was, um, was a cow costume. And the cow costume had like udders sticking out of this. And so I was like a little boy, maybe five years old, and like I remember being in church crying like, why do I have these? <laughs> okay, and, 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 but, but I was like, I, I threw a fit. I was embarrassed. Um, I was embarrassed. Why? Because guess what? Who are wiser, children or adults? Adults. It's, you know, it's clear, right? Gray hair associated with wisdom. So sometimes parents, in order... To make wise decisions, you're going to have to deal with the foolishness of your kids. The good thing about Ruth and Naomi is Na Ruth was much younger, but she's not a, she's not a kid. Okay? She, she, was, she grew wise. She, she knows she has to work hard. And sometimes parents, they have to deal with when they are living in a tight budget and they're teaching the kids how to save how to not be tempted by all sorts of things. One of the things that parents have to understand um, is, are they able to resist the will of their children who are saying mean things to them? Who, I mean, don't tell me that I'm the only person who's ever said something that hurt my parents' feeling, okay? And you know what? One of the things is that when I was a kid, you know where I wanted to go instead of the thrift store instead of Salvation Army. We never went to Goodwill. I don't think there was a Goodwill that was near us. There was mostly Salvation Army and the, the village discount. That's where we would glean, right? Um, but what was the place? It was Target. Yeah, Target. Why? It's, it's like, wow, Target is so clean. Back then, the logo for the Target was the... Um, the dog, remember the dog spot with the, with the eye and the circle? Or Walmart, in the Walmart commercials, they had the smiley face 
that would hop around and tell people about the deals. Now, the truth is, did you know this, that the quality of stuff that is at Target and at Walmart, they're not always a higher quality than the things at thrift stores, right? Especially since there, a lot of them are fast fashion and things like that. Um, but they are cleaner and they're brand new, things like that. But sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking that unless I present myself as um, brand new all the time, then I'm nothing. But again, even if people look down on you, who does God look at? You, and what does he look at? He looks at your heart, not at the way that you appear. Okay? I remember also, like, when we wanted candy, we wanted, like, the candy that looks so cool. There's no discount signs at Jewel Osco, but my mom would get candy from, like, Marshalls. You know, like, the candy in the, the, the ones that, like, they look good, but you've never seen those brands before, and they're so heavily discounted, and you know that, like, they're from five years ago, but it's like, wow. But I remember these things. We used to go to all of these different um, places, and I used to, and I, and, but the thing is, if you don't lead your families, and you don't, and you don't live your life in a way that is wise, and is careful about your resources and making sure that you survive and thrive, then you are going to be foolishly letting go of a lot of the things that God has given you. Why do we give our tithes? Because we love God. Why do we give our tithes? To honor God. But why do we give our tithes? Because it belongs to the Lord. Why? Because who gave us our wealth? God. Now who gave us the other 90% of our wealth? God as well, right? God doesn't say, give me your tithe because I only gave you the 10%. The reason why we give the 10% is because he put it in our hands, but he technically didn't give it to us. It, it, it still belongs to him, right? But the other 90% of our wealth, it belongs to us, but it's given by God. And don't you think that the things that are given to you by God should be used also with... Um, with wisdom as well. The things that are used by God should be used with wisdom. So we should, like Ruth, when we're in need, be willing to do what we need to do in order to get things done. Okay? So she departed and went in the, in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was the family of Elimelech. And it would just so happen that if you are willing to stoop low and go and do the hard work because you've been so restricted. Sometimes we think of restrictions as always a bad thing, but sometimes restrictions open up our mind to creativity and to different things that we can do. Notice that when God sent Jesus to save us, did he put restrictions on Jesus? Yes. Yes. He restricted him because though he existed in the form of God, he humbled himself and took on the form of a slave. You know, he didn't just restrict God. He didn't just restrict Jesus by telling Jesus, set aside your divinity and don't live out life as God. He even restricted Jesus by saying, oh, and by the way, you're not going to be born in a, a palace. You're not even going to be born a child of a synagogue leader. You're going to be born as the son of a carpenter. And yes, we know what a carpenter is, basically like an engineer back then, but still, it's not the same money that's being made today. He restricted his son and said, through this, through this ministry to the poor, you will be someone who will do great things. If you are restricted in your resources, will you find that as an excuse to not carry out life and not do the will of God? 
Or will you be able to rise above that and say, okay, I'll work within these constraints. I won't try to pretend that I can, that, the, that all of these things are unlimited, but I will do the best and make the most of these things. Now it's the same with students here. Students, you know for a fact that you cannot afford the same things as many, as, as, as some of your much wealthier and richer classmates can afford. Some people, they can't afford a private tutor. They can't afford, um, I mean, look at, look, at, look, at, look at, for example, the foolishness of, of Lori Laughlin and some of these parents who paid all of their money and resources in order to get their kids into the best colleges by faking things. It's not even the best colleges. It was UCL. It was USC. In order to, um, you know, pretend to be part of a rowing team, have all these fake recommendation letters, but then they get put on display of foolishness because, look, she went to jail, okay? Although she's out of jail now. Um, but it's the same with, but now you look at those who are, um, they make it through despite the hardest of resources. It's like schools look at that and say, wow, there is something there to be appreciated, all right? Within the constraints that you have, even this, um, those in the Chicago school system, it becomes very competitive because of selective enrollment. Those who don't make it into a selective enrollment school, that's no excuse to say, oh, well, I'm going to be disappointed in where I'm at, and I'm not going to work hard in school anymore. Okay? I'm not going to do these things. I'm not, I, 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 I'm not going to push myself to the fullest because I've failed. Or those who are not able to get into the best colleges. Those who are in even community colleges. Sometimes community colleges are looked down upon. And I've known so many people who they haven't finished community college because they felt like they were in such a low place. They, they, they hear what's said about them, made fun of them, and they are not able. But then there are some of those who are able to push through and say, I don't care about the low place that I'm in. I'm going to succeed and push hard and do the work that, 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 that is pleasing to the Lord anyways. And it is in those moments where you say, I'm going to work hard and do my best, no matter where I'm at. I'm not going to think of anything as too low for me to do. It's in those moments that you will find the treasure that God has in store for you. Okay? In those moments where you find the treasure. Remember this. The kingdom of God is like a pearl of great price. The kingdom of God is like a field where a man has found a treasure in there and will be willing to sell everything and do anything to get to that treasure. If you have a strong conviction that the Lord wants you to prosper and thrive, then you will be willing to do anything in order to succeed and do what he wants you to do. And I want you to see another thing. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord be with you bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? The servant in charge of the reapers replied and said, she is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and has remained from the morning until now. And she has been sitting in the house for a little while. Again, from the morning until now. Today, we try to factor in our lives, what time am I going to at least have some relaxation to watch Netflix, or scroll through TikTok, or um, do whatever, go, go, go eat out, go spend my money, go do this. But Ruth knows the situation she's in, and she says, I'm going to work hard, work hard. I used to be annoyed at my, um, at, at my, mom especially when she would like go on craigslist because i don't know what percentage of our house is made up of craigslist parts right um or the times that like we have to go drive somewhere far to do something why because she knows the constraints our family has and so if we have to drive all the where did we get those bricks tita jessica with mano where was that that was all the way in in West Chicago, if we had to drive so far to pick up some free bricks 
that someone was going to throw away, we're going to do it, okay? We're going to work hard, and she was working hard from the morning until now. Listen to this. Boaz said to Ruth, listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maids. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Then she fell on her face, bowing down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And Boaz replied to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. See, the work that she's been doing has been spreading around, and it's winning favor. Notice there's nothing here that mentions her beauty. Charm is deceitful. And beauty is, not divine, vain, vain, deceitful and divine. That is, I don't know what translation you're using. <laughs> Look at this. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll continue this um, on, um, what's he call it? Sunday night, that's what I'm teaching again. But understand this, Boaz then all of a sudden gives favor to Ruth, Okay. She give, he gives favor to Ruth and says, hey, um, you can go actually glean with my workers, and stuff like that. Stay close to my workers. And one of the reasons why is because this helps her not be sexually abused or harassed by any like, other poor people who might be going there. But when things get easier for Ruth, Ruth does not take this as a reason to start relaxing and say, oh, Boaz is letting me have an easier time. I'm not going to work as hard. I'm just going to chill and sit back because I have favor in the eyes of the one who owns the field. In fact, Ruth says, oh, okay, then I can work even harder, and she's able to bring home even more grain to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Okay? When things get better for us, don't take advantage of that in the sense of saying, oh, this is a reason now for me to become lazy, right? Um, for my family, the Lord gave us favor in the eyes of some people at a very specific school, at, at Jones, right? What would be wrong is for me and my siblings to say, oh, then I'm just gonna chillax and sit back because um, um, one of the things was uh, we had favor in the eyes of this old teacher who used to, to work um, there. She's no longer there anymore. But I remember um, she, she liked me. I was, I was in her academic decathlon team and she had favor on me. And I didn't take that as an advantage and say, okay, I'm not going to put any effort into this class and no effort into these things, right? When someone has favor on you, don't say, I'm going to take advantage of that favor by being lazy. Instead, the way that we take advantage of favor that is upon us is by making the most of it and using it wisely and skillfully, just like Ruth did. Okay? Do not let your hard work ethic slip when things get better. Because sometimes the favor comes in the form of prosperity. You become wealthier, you begin to prosper, you get a promotion at your job, and then you say, I can relax now. Okay? I think that we um, have to see that there is a much more, um, when we're in need, Really get on your knees and pray to the Lord and see there is so much more that the Lord has in store for you. Begin to take stock of what you can do and say, what can I do in order to provide for my kids, provide for my family? What can I do to put myself through school because I believe this is exactly what God wants me um, to do? And I'll say this though also. When you work hard, it makes the Sabbath rest even more satisfying, if you actually rest on the Sabbath, okay? If 
you don't rest on the Sabbath, if you don't have a time for um, resting, like we're gathered here right now, if you worked hard, then you can freely worship the Lord and lay down all your burdens when you come to Him and truly rest in Him. Be rejuvenated for when you are going to um, start working again and do all those things. Even on Sunday, you know, children, you might have the opportunity to do so many things tomorrow. Enjoy your, go, go to a party, go do this. But children also, a lot of you guys are in a very privileged position in that your parents, especially um, children in an Asian household, your parents really want you guys to do well in school. So if you tell your parents, I have schoolwork, guess what most of the times your parents will let you do? Your schoolwork. So take advantage and actually do it. Why? Because then you can free, really, really focus and do this thing so that when it comes time to rest in the Lord, you can rest in the Lord. Work hard and don't think of yourself too highly than you ought to. Don't be unwilling to stoop low because we are seeking the kingdom of God together. Amen? Amen. Let's stand.